Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, and we're going to read verses 10 through 18. And it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end. With all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I want to preach a message this morning called, Are You Dressed for Battle? Are you dressed for battle? Pray for me this morning. God, I need your help. I need your anointing, Lord, to preach this word, Father. We are in warfare, God, and I pray that you would prepare our hearts and minds for what you want to speak to us, God, that you get us ready for this battle. As David said, teach our hands to war and our fingers to fight, O God. Have your way this morning in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Are you dressed for battle? One of the most important truths we must understand this morning, church, is that we are in warfare. And this warfare we are in will continue until we pass from this present life into eternity. This is why the Apostle Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 verse 3 and 4, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one that is engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has called him or enlisted him as a soldier. You and I must understand this morning that this warfare that we are facing in, is not a physical battle. It's not in the physical realm. Therefore, it cannot be fought in that realm. As our text says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, and spiritual hosts of wickedness. And because our enemy is a spiritual one, we must fight him with the Holy Spirit of God and the weapons that he has provided for us to be victorious. And because our enemy is a spiritual one, and because we face this not in the physical realm, we cannot get our eyes on the physical realm. We have to have eyes to see what is truly going on. For too long, the enemy has shifted our focus from the spiritual onto the physical. We think a person that doesn't like us is our enemy or some political party that we oppose is our enemy or a hundred other things. And because our focus is on the natural instead of the spiritual, we miss the real battle taking place. This is the mistake that Job's friends made when they came to talk to him about all his misfortune. They only saw in the natural and they, they thought, Job, surely you're the problem. Surely the reason you're going through these things is because you've sinned and you've done this. But if they would have just had spiritual eyes to see, they would have seen that in fact a battle was raging in the spiritual realm for Job's soul. There was a battle facing him that no one could see. See, Satan was doing everything he could to get Job to turn away from God. But God knew that Job loved and feared God. So he allowed the enemy to come in and to fight him. And many times we face warfare and we face these things that come against us because God is proving our character. A soldier has to build experience when he goes on the battlefield. An unexperienced soldier can be very dangerous. Because he has not learned how to be under the heat of battle. He has not learned what it means to watch comrades die beside him. He doesn't understand these things yet. So he might have heard of them. But until he's experienced them, he's an untrained soldier. And so God allows the enemy to come and to fight against us. To make us stronger. That the trying of our faith being that much more precious than gold. That perishes. Hallelujah. God is working something inside us. He allows the battles to come to your doorstep to make you a better soldier for Jesus Christ. Job found that it was an unseen battle. 
It was an unseen battle that only a spiritually minded person could see. Remember Elisha's servant we talked about several weeks ago. He comes out of his house one morning to find there is an army surrounding the city that the prophet Elisha is in. Now I don't know why they they thought they needed an army to take on one little prophet, but they sent one anyhow. Let's look at 2 Kings 6 verse 15 through 17. It says, And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. See, the devil roused the king of Assyria to send an army against the man of God. But Elisha knew that the true battle was not against men in the physical realm. But the real reason he was confident was because he had eyes to see where the battle truly lied. And he had the greatest eyesight of all and that was to see that there was more with him that was against him and the greatest eyesight that you and I can understand is that no matter what comes against us no matter the forces of darkness that greater is he that is within me than he that's within this world hallelujah and if you only see in the physical realm then you will become panicked like this servant But if you see the battle in the spiritual realm and understand once again that God is greater, He's stronger than what we face. And if you know that He'll never leave you or forsake you. And if you know that you're more than a conqueror through Him that loves you. Then you can stand in the battle and fight and win because the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord of hosts is with you to give you victory wherever you go. Hallelujah. Praise God. And because our battles lie in the spiritual realm, we must fight using the spiritual armor and the spiritual weapons that God has provided. So let's look at them this morning. The first part of this armor is the belt of truth. One of the enemy's most effective weapons against us is the lies he tells us. He fights against us continually with lies to unravel us. But the belt of truth holds our armor together. It holds fast that which we have. And we can stand against Him knowing what God has said and what He has promised. And we know that His Word is true and faithful. Jesus said in John 8, 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Without the belt of truth, we cannot walk in freedom and liberty that God wants us to walk in. We must have the belt of truth. The second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. In battles, the breastplate was crucial because it continually protected the vital organs like the heart from being attacked. So in the spiritual realm, we are given the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness simply means right standing before God. When Satan begins to attack your heart, which is the seed of your emotions, your will, your desires, you have to put your heart under the Lordship of Christ. And every decision you make must come from that place of right standing with God and that desire to remain in right standing with God. That place of desiring to please God because you've given your life to Him and given your heart to Him and surrendered to Him. Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me. He says, because I love Him, because I've given my heart to Him, there's certain things I do and certain things I won't do because I love Him. My heart belongs to him. He says, I'm protecting my heart with that breastplate of righteousness. The enemy can't attack. He can't break through that breastplate of righteousness when we stand for God. The third piece of armor is for your feet. Shoes that you wear as you go with and in the preparation of the gospel of peace. Another translation says this, shoes of gospel readiness. It means wherever you go, you are always prepared to share the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I know many Christians today that are never wearing this piece of armor. 
But without the right shoes in battle, you will lose your footing during a crucial moment in the fight and you could be mortally wounded. Too many Christians today have no idea how to share their faith. And not only that, many go out with no intention of ever sharing about Jesus. In a study conducted by Lifeway Research, it was found that 80% of those who attend the church one or more times a month believe they have a personal responsibility to share their faith. 20% believe they did not. However, of that 80% who believed that they had a responsibility to share their faith, 61% of them admitted they had not shared their faith in a very long period of time, and many it had been years. So in other words, of those who go to church and claim to know Jesus, only 19% of them tell other people about Jesus. 81% of the church does not share their faith. We have an army walking around without shoes. 81% church. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm, so were a lot of those disciples. 120 of them in an upper room. And then suddenly the Holy Spirit of God fell on that upper room. A man who once denied Jesus three times before a little servant girl. And suddenly standing up on the rooftops and saying, You men of Galilee, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. The man that you crucified. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And he's preaching the gospel and thousands are coming into the kingdom of God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit makes the difference. And we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. I had a preacher friend of mine once say this. The gospel, the great commission, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He says there's only two reactions to that. You either go or you disobey. God has called all of us to preach this gospel. Not just the person who stands behind this desk, but every single one of you God has called you. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, it is the whole job of the whole church to preach the whole gospel to the whole world. You owe the world this gospel, church. You owe your neighbor the gospel. You owe your co-worker the gospel. Do they know that there's a reason for hope. We must once again put on these shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace so that we have sure footing against the enemy. There's nothing that's better of a proactive way to fight sin than to be busy about the work of the kingdom of God. Because it was when David stopped fighting. It's when he put his sword down. That's when he fell into sin with Bathsheba. But as long as he was on the battlefield, as long as he kept the sword in his hand and kept fighting, then he was gaining victory and gaining ground. But when you take your shoes off, you're done for the day, aren't you? But we're never done for the day, church. We're never done for the day. God's called us to share the gospel. Next, the Bible says, take up the shield of faith. A shield is extremely useful in warfare. Because it is, can be raised to block blows from any angle coming at you. And can be used to stop an arrow from getting anywhere close to your body. And sometimes it was during those battles that they would fire flaming arrows at their opponents. And the Romans had a very special way of dealing with this. They had a unique formation that they would take all their troops and they would put side by side and shield in front of shield. And some of the ones in the middle would put their shield above their head. And so they would make an impenetrable blockade together, shield against shield, until there was no place for an arrow to come and hit their comrade. We need to learn to do that as a church, don't we? We need to learn to cover each other in prayer. We need to come beside each other. Brother Ronnie, I'm right beside you. I got my shield right here. Brother Ronnie says, okay, I got my shield right here. I'm blocking for you. I'm going to pray for you. When was the last time you prayed for your brothers and sisters in this church? We need to stand together with our shields of faith blocking the enemy from coming in. Sometimes the devil fights up close and sometimes he uses ranged attacks. But no matter what the Bible says, the shield of faith can quench all the fiery darts or arrows of the wicked one. Every attack of the enemy is against our faith and trust in God. 
He shoots his fiery arrows of doubt and discouragement. But we must lift up the shield of faith. And as we believe God, we will see the victory, church. Next is the helmet of salvation. The helmet was always used to protect the head and most importantly the brain from damage during combat. Can I tell you this morning that there is nowhere the enemy attacks harder than your mind. Before a battle is ever manifested in the physical, it is often preceded by a battle of the mind. The enemy attacks there with his thoughts, his temptations. But if we have that helmet of salvation, if you know that you are saved and you belong to Christ, then the enemy can throw whatever he wants at you because your mind is focused on one thing. Paul said in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, this one thing I do, they do this thing over there and a hundred things over there, but this one thing I do, I have a focus on that, Listen, the enemy will try to distract you from your focus on Christ. He'll try to discourage you. But this one thing I do, I don't have time to think about anything else. And when that becomes your mindset, the enemy has no room to fill your mind with his thoughts because you have the mind of Christ. We must watch and be careful what we allow behind that helmet. What do you watch? What do you fill your mind with? What music do you listen to? This affects your thinking patterns. But if your eyes are focused on Christ, your mind is single upon Christ, then you will stand in the battle. Remember, as long as Peter's eyes and mind were focused on Christ, he walked on the waves. We must have that mind focused on Christ with the helmet of salvation. The last piece of armor... And the only offensive weapon listed is the sword of the Spirit. When the devil comes against you, you have a weapon that is far deadlier than anything this world possesses in the natural. It says in Hebrews 4 verse 12, The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We must pick up the sword of the Spirit again and fight the enemy. But we cannot do that if we are never in the Word of God. We have a new generation of Christians who have no sword because they don't know the Word. So they are unarmed. They rely on a podcast or some quotes on social media instead of a thus saith the Lord. I'm not downplaying good Christian books or quotes or radio programs or any of that, but we can't substitute them for the Word of God. We must know His Word and the promises it contains if we are to stand against the enemy and win. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit and the weapons that He gives us, the sword of the Spirit, that we attack. The, so many times we're on the defense with the devil. So many times we're just like, oh, just leave me alone, please. Just leave me alone. But we need to get a little aggressive with the enemy. See, if you know who you are in Christ, if you know where you stand with God, if you have that armor upon yourself, you don't have to fear the enemy. You only fear God. You walk with God and you say, devil, it is written. Get your hands off of my marriage. Get your hands off my kids. Listen, sometimes you got to pry the devil's hands off of them. you got to cut the devil's hands off of them in prayer. Hallelujah. Which leads to this next part. Ephesians 6 ends with this verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I said earlier, the sword of the Spirit is our only offensive weapon, but in actuality, prayer is also a very highly offensive weapon. Not too long ago, there was a great Christian movie that was released called War Room. In the movie, an older saint of God named Miss Claire teaches another woman that the battle she faces can only be won through prayer. I think the reason many times the enemy runs us over is because we don't take time to pray. We hope our kids get saved. We hope God puts our marriage back together. 
But we don't get down on our knees in prayer and fight the enemy back. We don't get down into that secret place, that secret closet of prayer and do warfare with the enemy. But it's time we learn the true battleground that we must fight on. And it is in prayer where we truly learn spiritual warfare. Prayer not only attacks the enemy, but it strengthens the person praying and being prayed for. Wednesday night we had a prayer and I was down in the altar praying and then as I was praying suddenly I felt hands being laid upon me. And as my brothers and sisters began to pray for me suddenly there was just such a release. There was life, there was strength that flowed and I didn't ask anybody to pray for me. But people laid hands, they put the shield of faith up and said, we're blocking the enemy, let's lay hands, let's pray. Let me tell you something, don't ever underestimate the power of prayer when you lay hands and pray for people. Listen, many times, the only time we pray is in when it involves sickness, but there's so many more times we need to pray than just when somebody's sick. Somebody might be discouraged, somebody might be facing a battle of their lives, but they need their brothers and sisters to gather around them and say we're standing with you in the fight we're going to fight with you in this battle and God is going to give you the victory hallelujah many times in battles where before the troops were sent out the enemy was bombarded with arrows and trebuchets and catapults and it broke up the strongholds of the enemy so that when the soldiers came in the enemy was already pushed back And before you and I get into a fight with the enemy, we need to bombard the enemy's camp first with prayer. And then we need to go into the enemy's camp fully armed with the armor of God and dressed for the battle. And watch if God does not give us overwhelming victory church hallelujah we need to bombard the enemy's camp trebuchet catapult after catapult of fiery balls of prayer that just burst into the enemy's camp sending the demons flying because God is more and stronger than they are greater is he within me more is with us than was with them so let's pray and burst the enemy's camp and then let's go in Let's go in with the armor of God because God's going to give you overwhelming victory. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2.14 Now thanks be to God who always, always leads us in triumph in Christ. There's never going to be a battle you face when you follow Christ that He cannot and will not lead you into victory in. But you got to ask yourself this morning, are you dressed for battle? Because the battle's waging, church. It's going on all around us. The enemy's fighting. He knows his time is short. He's making war against the saints of the Most High. He's trying to weary us out. And there's many that are falling by the wayside because they were not grounded in Christ. The Bible says a great falling away would happen, and it's happening. I've talked to pastors all over the United States. They're watching as churches are falling apart. And not just because people can't come, but people have just lost interest. You see, that's the problem with a church that only entertains. When the entertainment's gone, so are the people. But when the people are there for God, and for the presence of God, then you can take that no matter where you go. If they put us in prison, Holy Spirit of God, come down in this prison. If they put us on the chopping block, Holy Spirit, come down. As in my final breath, I'm going to praise you. In my final breath, I'm going to worship you because you're worthy. Because the church is wherever we are. Because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So are you dressed for battle this morning, church? Are you ready to face the enemy? Are you missing a piece of your armor? Are you dressed for the battle? I'm amazed that you love me.